Now two wins from achieving the ultimate glory. Boston critically threw the first punch of Game 3, responding to Golden State runs all night, even surviving the flurry from the third quarter Warriors. Ime's decision to hedge instead of switch ball screens bothered Warrior ball handlers all night, but the magic from our game's greatest point guard in Stephen Curry kept the doves around. That made Game 3 a back and forth thriller for the ages, so this video breaks down every reason for why that was the case. Stay tuned to see each MVP for the Seas in their dramatic Game 3 W. Before continuing, only 12.2% of you watching right now are subscribed, so if you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss a single upload. Also, please drop a thumbs up, it takes a few seconds and makes a massive difference in YouTube's algorithm. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at dflowhoops and I'll follow you back. Link is down below in the description for those two platforms. Confidently bouncing back from the hard-nosed Draymond Green ownership of Game 3, Boston proved how tough and championship-bred their team's mentality truly is, something I've seen in them for a while. Many didn't take Boston seriously after the Bucks without Chris Middleton took them to seven games, but it was right after taking out the reigning champs where I predicted a Celtics championship, and even before the playoffs started, we talked about why the Seas were built for the finals. Of course, Golden State's also received a similar amount of respect on this channel throughout this year, for what both the Celtics and Warriors have had to go through and how they performed in 2022's playoffs, however, Boston's been my pick to go the distance for a little while, and even though I'm a Raptor fan and they're a division rival, I've come to admire how special the duo of the Jays are. These two broke my heart, but looking back on it, executed against a Toronto team that had a chance to win back-to-back -back championships back in the bubble, with my Raps having elite defenders in Kyle Lowry, OG Ananobi, Serge Ibaka, and Pascal Siakam, Boston still dominated to open the series, taking a 2-0 series lead. To my delight, Toronto ultimately forced seven games in that series, but I learned a valuable lesson that I've been trying to warn the entire league about in my Celtic videos this season. That lesson I learned was that Jalen Brown's two-way impact with his three-level scoring combined with Jason Tatum's silky smooth perimeter bucket getting, with both playing elite defense, is going to cause problems for any caliber of opponent placed in front of them. Those who didn't fully interpret that lesson have suffered the consequences as the likable, feisty, and most importantly dominant Celtics have taken out one team after the other in these playoffs. This team doesn't perform as sharply as they can consistently, that's something they need to improve on, but Boston does know how to bounce back pretty damn well, as they're now 7-0 in these playoffs after a loss. Tatum and Brown combined for 53 Game 3 points on 46% shooting from the floor and 41% shooting from distance. The Warriors can't say that the Celtics role players just went off and that this game was a fluke like they could in Game 1. Boston's stars performed up to their capabilities, and the city of Boston can throw a parade down Causeway Street with two more wins. My Raps won the chip in 2019, and I can tell you how good of a feeling it was even from a fan's perspective, and if Boston takes care of the rock, stays focused, and doesn't get too comfortable, it seems like Beantown's about to witness something special here. Many argue that it's Kevin McHale and Larry Bird, but based off Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown's combined athleticism, two-way impact, and scoring punch, while old heads are going to let me have it in the comments section like they always do when I claim this, I'd have to argue that JT and JB are the most talented duo in Celtics history. Now, that doesn't mean they're the greatest, but in terms of talent, in my humble opinion, it's the Jays. More on them coming up but the Williams brothers in Grant and Rob were extremely impactful as well. Despite not being 100% whatsoever battling a knee injury, the Time Lord had the game of his life, stuffing the stat sheet with 8 points, 10 boards, 4 blocks, and 3 steals, while being a game high plus 21. RW3 is undeniably the most versatile, quick-footed, and in my opinion, the best defender at the center position in the NBA today. Meanwhile, the Dark Knight in Grant Williams also heavily impacted Game 3 with his second line of defense. Batman's strength, rebounding, and even splice of deep range scoring were all a factor as well. Entering Game 3, the Warriors were outscoring the Celtics 73-40 in third quarters, and that trend seemed to be continuing early on, 
as Golden State cut Boston's lead to eight, but momentum shifted when Curry picked up his fourth foul. Marcus Smart drained two free throws, knocked a pass off Draymond out of bounds, and off the inbounds, Jalen Brown leaked out in transition to extend the lead to 13, making Steve Kerr call timeout. But things changed drastically after that timeout, as Steph's four-point play resulted in a flagrant foul on Al Horford, who didn't give Curry any landing space, which could have easily injured him, giving the Warriors two free throws and the ball back, incredibly, after an Otto Porter Jr. three-pointer. That ended up being a seven-point possession for the Dubs. A few plays later, Stephen Curry got a screen from Otto and knocked down a 25-footer, miraculously giving the Warriors their first lead since when they were up 2-0. After Game 3, the Warriors are now outscoring the Dubs 106-65 in third quarters. Luckily for Boston, Steve Kerr took Curry off, which allowed the Seas to maintain a four-point advantage entering an intense final 12 minutes. In that final quarter, Boston continued to trust their game plan to hedge instead of switch screen and rolls, and the length of Robert Williams and Jason Tatum, plus the Celtics collectively upping their intensity and trusting their defensive strategy, despite Curry hitting three after three on them a quarter earlier, eventually started to disrupt the rhythm of Steph and other Warrior ball handlers. It also helped Boston that Steve Kerr rested Klay Thompson to open the fourth. Klay kept the Warriors alive when Curry rested in the late third, but when Steph was in, he and Thompson combined for a vicious 25 points back in quarter number three. Not having both of those two on the floor at all times really hurt Golden State. In terms of the players former coach and current general manager Brad Stevens acquired, Big Al Horford, and the other baby-faced assassin in this series and Derek White were extremely impactful. After White's dribble penetration, whether he takes it to the hoop on a line drive or kicks it out, continues to take Boston's offense to new heights. Meanwhile, a man who set the NBA record for the most playoff games without competing in the finals before 2022 in Al Horford was bodying Otto Porter Jr. in the post and also blocked automatic shot from the corner in the opening frame. The veteran seemed to have the legs that he didn't have in the previous game too. Boston kicked off game three by dominating like it was the fourth quarter of game one and maintained that focus throughout despite taking an overhand right and then an uppercut from the Splash Brothers. Initiating the hot start was Jalen Brown, who dropped 12 points on four for six shooting and two triples in just the first nine and a half minutes, and the Celtics shot 10 for 15 in that opening span. Jalen had 17 points in the first quarter and 22 in the opening half. We'll get to when Tatum came alive in game three, but given Jason's dealing with a bad shoulder, JB's ability to act as the number one guy at any given time was undeniably clutch. I tried to warn people about how elite Jalen Brown was in my Celtic videos all throughout this season and playoffs, calling him the most talented second option in the league, and comparing him to a hybrid of Tracy McGrady with his jump shooting and LeBron James with his athleticism. Coach Ime Udoka's made the wise commitment to keep one of Jalen Brown or this team's number one option in Jason Tatum on the court at all times, which must make Celtic fans feel pretty comfortable. I can only imagine. I know these guys are going to be a problem for my Raptors in the Atlantic division for this next decade. From start to finish, the Celtics looked focused and composed with their execution, making shots and rotating on the back end defensively. Jason Tatum came alive in the second quarter with his playmaking, locating Marcus Smart for inside buckets, looking comfortable with his shot off the dribble, and exposing Curry in the post. Tatum was also causing problems for Warrior attackers with his clamps, showing why he's an underrated perimeter stopper. No one would call Jason the most valuable wing stopper in the association, but with his 106.3 defensive rating that ranked first among all small forwards this year, that would make him just that. In terms of when he's defending off the ball, Tatum's definitely gotten better at anticipating passes and blitzing the lane, but honestly, Jason's seven-foot wingspan has always been difficult to complete passes against, but in one-on-one -on -one scenarios, that part of Tatum's defense throughout the course of his career has elevated to a stratosphere many predicted it would never get to. Struggling with a shoulder injury that's bothered him for quite some time, while he's missed some makeable open layups, 
Jason's inspirationally excelled through that setback as the Eastern Conference Finals MVP. is always creating offense with his facilitating, regardless of if he's found his jump shooting rhythm. I know Tatum doesn't think he's a superstar, but it's that very trust of his teammates and pure elite playmaking for his 6'9 frame that makes him one of our game's top players. In terms of the DPOY Marcus Smart, he committed some typically dumb turnovers, which he definitely needs to quell, but for the most part, he was going to work in the post, whether he was fading away or backing down on smaller dub defenders. Tatum, Brown, and Smart combined for 77 points in this one and became the first trio to each have 20 points, 5 boards, and 5 dimes in a finals game since Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Magic Johnson, and Michael Cooper in 1984. Theme of the game was how the Celtics responded time after time. First, after Golden State cut the lead to single digits in the first half, Boston upped their pressure, forcing Klay Thompson into an air ball and then turning the Warriors over. To an even more lethal Warrior run in quarter number three, again the Celtics rebounded to a Golden State flurry, showcasing the resilience they've shown as a team all year. Boston dropped to 18 wins and 21 losses way back on January 6th. Jalen Brown said the energy was about to shift, Ime Udoka's system was finally bought into, and the rest is history. These Celtics are extremely well-rounded, with underrated contributors 1 through 10, as when Marcus Smart, Peyton Pritchard, along with the Brad Stevens acquisitions of Al Horford and Derek White, stay poised and confident, that makes Boston incredibly tough to beat once, let alone four times in the span of seven games. Who was Game 3's low-key hero for Boston? Best answer down below in the comments gets next video shout out. Top 5 commenters by June 21st receive free NBA merchandise this summer. So leave your take on today's question to compete in Community Speaks. Today's Speaks winner is Swu, who says Game 3 is going to Boston. They usually bounce back really well with a top performance after a loss in these playoffs. Great prediction there. Appreciate every answer. I hope you have a great one. DFlow signing off.